On a cold Christmas night in 1776, a small group of American soldiers, under the command of General George Washington, crossed the Delaware River and launched a surprise attack on British forces at Trenton. It is perhaps the most famous moment in the history of the American Revolution, immortalized here in an 1851 painting by a German-American artist named Emanuel Lutze. This portrayal was not created to memorialize an old revolution, but to inspire an ongoing one. Since 1848, German politicians and activists on all sides of the political spectrum had been struggling to topple the long-entrenched Prussian monarchy and build a modern German state. Lutze hoped the image of America's founders, fighting against all odds, would spur his comrades to victory over a tyrannical king. Most Americans don't know that side of the story, though. Instead, Lutze's painting has become a quintessential piece in the foundation of the American myth. In his romanticized portrayal, George Washington stands at the front of the boat, boldly leading his nation to victory. Behind him, carrying the flag, is a man who would later claim the mantle of Washington's legacy. He was the last of the Founding Fathers to be president, and few figures would do more to shape the official version of the American Revolution than him. His name was James Monroe. James Monroe was born in the British colony of Virginia in 1758. His family was not as wealthy as many of the other future heroes of the Revolution, and money would prove to be a constant problem in his life. As a young lad, Monroe was taken to the House of Burgesses, the official British Parliament of Virginia, and it was there he saw a local planter named Thomas Jefferson give a speech. Like many of the planter class, Jefferson had become increasingly agitated by rising British taxes, and opposition to the British crown grew by the day. On July 4th, 1776, Jefferson completed a Declaration of Independence for the American colonies, denouncing British tyranny and dismissing the divine right of its monarch with a simple phrase, all men are created equal. These words stirred in the hearts of many aspiring revolutionaries including James Monroe, who could not resist the opportunity to sign up and fight in the War for Independence. Dropping out of college, Monroe joined a regiment in the Virginia Continental Army, eventually being called to join the New Jersey campaign under General George Washington. Monroe hunkered down for the long, cold winters at Valley Forge, where hundreds of troops starved and froze. It was there that on December 25th, 1776, Monroe, along with hundreds of other troops, crossed the Delaware River to attack the British Allied Hessian troops at Trenton. The young lieutenant performed bravely, sustaining a minor wound and earning the respect of General Washington. It is with pleasure I take occasion to express to you the high opinion I have of Lieutenant Monroe. He has, in every instance, maintained the reputation of a brave, active, and sensible officer. Washington's praise would serve as Monroe's calling card in the pivotal post-revolutionary years. The British eventually gave up and officially recognized the United States as an independent and sovereign nation, but the challenges for the fledgling republic were far from over. One of the first questions the new nation needed urgently to answer was how to pay all the soldiers who'd fought and bled on the field of battle. No solid currency yet existed for the nation, and leaving its heroes without pay was a great way to ensure the new republic quickly devolved into factionalism and civil war. What there was an abundance of was land, and land certificates quickly became the main currency in the United States. Throughout the next few years, Monroe acquired a healthy collection of land certificates 
often through speculation, bulk purchase, and even card games. Monroe's private plantation empire would be a practice run for the public empire he would one day help to create. As the 18th century entered its final decades, and the U.S. struggled to fill its coffers with income, farmers began transitioning off highly specialized tobacco planting to a crop which was in much higher demand to European customers, cotton. Cotton provided incredible opportunities for the enrichment of white farmers, especially those who used African-American slave labor. Slavery grew immensely during this period, and planters like Monroe, who once professed high ideals of freedom and human rights, leapt at the opportunity to enslave African Americans for huge profits. James Monroe was largely an absentee slave owner, spending most of his time traveling, often making bad business deals and gambling his human assets away in card games. Monroe's poor business skills meant his farms rarely turned a profit, and the on-site staff tasked with overseeing the cultivation of the cotton and its slave labor workforce often took their frustrations out on the workers. Many families were separated as a result of Monroe's frivolous gamblings, which forced them to sneak off the farms to visit their family members. The result of illegal cross-plantation fraternizations like these was the building of bonds among enslaved laborers across different farms. These interactions often provided safe spaces for enslaved people to congregate and express their frustrations about their conditions. Some of these meetings turned into what we would today describe as union activity, and eventually strikes and revolts. At times, slave strikes would result in better conditions. But during Monroe's term as governor of Virginia, a case arose which put the cause of the enslaved in stark perspective. In the fall of 1800, a highly skilled enslaved blacksmith named Gabriel was caught stealing a pig from a local farm. In the self-proclaimed freest nation on earth, the punishment for a slave stealing a pig was death. But the sentence could be commuted to a branding if the offender recited a Bible verse. The intelligent Gabriel was able to do so and took his branding, but the incident pushed him past the point of no return. He began sneaking off the plantations and organizing meetings of enslaved laborers, building a movement to overthrow the oppressive plantation owners in hopes of claiming for his enslaved comrades the inalienable right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A plan was made for a coordinated attack against the plantation owners, followed by an armed march on Richmond, and by some accounts, an attempt to kidnap Governor Monroe himself and force him at gunpoint to abolish slavery in the state of Virginia. Gabriel's rebellion would have been the largest slave revolt yet seen in the United States, but as often happens in history, nature intervened. A massive rainstorm descended upon the land and forced Gabriel to postpone. In the intervening hours, word reached Governor Monroe of Gabriel's plans, and a militia was dispatched to round up the rebels. Gabriel initially escaped, but Governor Monroe put out a reward of $300 to anyone with information leading to his capture. A desperate enslaved worker pointed authorities to Gabriel's hiding spot, where he was captured. For the crime of plotting a revolt that never actually took place, Monroe sentenced Gabriel and 27 other plotters to death by hanging. As a final insult, after Gabriel was hanged, his owner was compensated $500 by the state for his loss of property. Like most plantation owners of his day, Monroe refused to see the parallel between his own struggle against the British monarchy and the enslaved laborers' struggle against their masters. But it was an irony not lost on one of Gabriel's comrades, who made a defiant plea at the gallows. I have nothing more to offer than what General Washington would have had to offer, had he been taken by the British and put to trial by them. I have adventured in my life in endeavoring to obtain the liberty of my countrymen, and am a willing sacrifice in their cause. The threat of slave revolts haunted Monroe's and many other slaveholders' dreams for years to come. Gabriel's rebellion pushed him toward a sense that slavery would eventually need to see its end, but 
rather than advocate for abolition and legal equality, Monroe became a strong proponent of ending slavery through deportation, euphemistically known as colonization. Society sprung up all around the country to devise projects for black deportation, often with financial and rhetorical support from people like James Monroe. Eventually, in 1824, when the nation of Liberia was founded as a first experiment in slave colonization, the capital was named in honor of the sitting president, who had been such a strong supporter of colonization throughout his life. If Monroe's experience in suppressing Gabriel's rebellion dampened his revolutionary spirit, his experiences in France would further pull him away from the fire of his younger days and push him towards a more conservative posture. Monroe actually visited France twice, first during the French Revolution. Although he was a vocal supporter of the revolution, he was incensed by the chaos and public executions he witnessed in the streets of Paris. He was shocked to learn that among the hundreds slated for the guillotine was the wife of a French military officer who had commanded American troops during the revolution, Adrienne de Lafayette. Monroe was eager to stay out of the drama himself, so his wife Elizabeth offered to take charge. Wending her way through the angry crowds surrounding the Lafayette residence, Elizabeth slipped through the front doorway, found Mrs. Lafayette, and escorted her to safety. When Monroe returned to Paris as ambassador in 1803, French power had been consolidated under the dictatorship of Napoleon Bonaparte. Despite his professed solidarity with the French Revolution, Monroe felt more at home in Napoleon's France, and according to some biographers, began developing his taste for more ostentatious showings of power and pageantry. This would play a role later in how Monroe led his country as president. But perhaps more crucially, while in France, Ambassador Monroe began to evince the possibility of wrestling control of a rather sizable piece of land in North America from Napoleon's control. Americans like Monroe recognized the important role trade would play in America's future as a nation. If the United States could snap up enough land to turn over enough crops to sell to Europe, there was no reason why the US couldn't become the wealthiest nation in the world. From an early time, Monroe recognized what it would mean for the U.S. to gain control of the prosperous port of New Orleans. For years, the city was a booming entry point for slaves, cash crops, and other supplies. But it was still under the control of the Spanish, and later, the French. Farmers like Monroe, producing cash crops in the American Northwest, saw the enormous potential of New Orleans and of the mighty Mississippi River to carry their products downstream and off to the world's markets. During his early land speculation days, Monroe became an early supporter of the U.S. taking control of the Mississippi and its prosperous port to the south. Now Monroe was representing his nation in France, and word was getting around that Napoleon might be interested in selling that Louisiana territory. In a small reception at the Palais du Louvre in Paris, Ambassador Monroe signed a deal which ceded 1 million square miles of land, an area larger than Great Britain, France, Germany, Spain, and Portugal combined, to the United States for $2 an acre. That's a good deal. The acquisition seemed too good to be true. Napoleon certainly seemed to think so. In a conversation with Monroe, he warned that the Louisiana Purchase may be taken as a provocation by the British, who occupied Canada and much of the American West. You Americans did brilliant things in your war with England. We shall, I am persuaded, always behave well when it shall be our lot to be in a war. You may probably be in a war with them again. Napoleon's prediction turned out to be true, and war came to the Americans less than a decade later. To say it was an unmitigated disaster for the United States would be an understatement. Under a new president, James Madison, the U.S. struggled to keep its divided country together, losing battle after battle on the high seas and along the frontier. The most devastating blow came in 1814, when British troops marched on Washington, D.C., burning the Capitol as well as the White House. Monroe had spent the early days of the war attending to personal affairs, but was quickly called in by Madison 
to join the cabinet and serve as Secretary of State. As Madison ran from his burning capital with his tail between his legs, Monroe continued to rally troops for a final assault against the British, though to no avail. In the days that followed, Monroe was made both Secretary of State and Secretary of War, the only person in American history to hold both posts at the same time. Monroe effectively set himself up as a military dictator, and although it's difficult to say how much of an effect Monroe had on the eventual outcome of the war, when it was finally ended, Monroe stood out as the only steady hand in the whole of Madison's disastrous administration. To no one's surprise, the Virginia planter was elected as America's fifth president in a landslide. At his inauguration on March 4, 1817, a highly ostentatious affair, President Monroe delivered a speech which set the tone for the optimistic period that lie ahead. From the commencement of our revolution to the present day, almost 40 years have elapsed. And what has been the effect? To whatever object we turn our attention, we find abundant cause to felicitate ourselves in the excellence of our institutions. During a period fraught with difficulties and marked by very extraordinary events, the United States has flourished beyond example. Their citizens, individually, have been happy and the nation prosperous. James Monroe had been through quite an evolution in his political views throughout his time in politics. As a Virginia planter, he'd been a strong anti-federalist and a firm believer in states' rights and a weak central government. Monroe was part of a group who opposed the adoption of the U.S. Constitution, believing that a federal government with the power to collect taxes and create an army would quickly devolve into a dictatorship. Like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison before him, he had allied himself with the small government Republican Party in opposition to the Federalist Party with such stars as John Adams and Alexander Hamilton. But by now, Monroe had seen how a divided nation without a standing army fared in a war against a competing empire during the War of 1812. Monroe would make ending the Federalist Party and consolidating the country under a single party system the goal of his administration. But Monroe, a longtime political insider, was no ideologue. Ending the two party system would prove to be less about destroying the ideas of the Federalists and more about co opting their agenda into the Republican Party to create a single party system amenable to the views and opinions of all people. There is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. The year Monroe was elected, his old friend and now Supreme Court Justice John Marshall had released a five volume series on the life of George Washington, and Monroe had devoured every page. Washington's example became the standard for the new president, who channeled the nation's founding father in dress, manner, as well as action. During his presidency, George Washington had embarked on a brief tour of the northwest part of the country. Monroe would do Washington one better, embarking on a national tour across as much of the country as he could reasonably visit. Donning a blue coat and buff breeches, Monroe almost played the role of a Washington impersonator, though by many accounts, a less imposing one. As he set out for Baltimore, word of his tour spread quickly. In every town, Americans lined up for a chance to catch a glimpse of a real-life Revolutionary War hero. In Trenton, Monroe visited the site of his famous Delaware Crossing, where he'd caught the notice of General Washington, as well as a Hessian bullet. Veterans lined up along the streets to salute Monroe, calling out names of battles where they'd served alongside the president during the Revolution. Continuing north, Monroe made stops in Philadelphia, New York, Hartford, and Boston. The effect was a sensation, which was lauded in every newspaper across the land. Even that old cynic John Adams got into the spirit, inviting the president over for a lavish dinner, which provoked waves of cheers from onlookers. Former First Lady Abigail Adams captured what it was about Monroe that made him perfectly suited for this kind of reconciliation tour. All who met the president were captivated by his agreeable affability, unassuming manners, and his polite attentions to all orders and ranks. 
A Boston newspaper coined the term, which seemed to encapsulate what the Monroe administration was ushering in. They called it an era of good feelings, though Monroe's victory over party politics would ultimately prove to be a brief armistice. Many of Monroe's young cabinet members, Henry Clay and John Adams, along with his Florida Napoleon Andrew Jackson, would compete fiercely in the elections of 1824 and 1828, giving birth to the Democratic Party and the Whig Party. The Whigs would later evolve into the Republicans, and partisanship remains a staple of American democracy to this day. Monroe's parades and patriotic displays may have given people good feelings, but it was helpless to stop the crises which came around the turn of the decade. The end of the War of 1812 may have left the U.S. Capitol in ashes, but nothing could compare to the state that Europe was in. They too had suffered disastrous warfare as Napoleon launched invasions across Europe and clashed with the Russians. When the dust cleared, Europe was in ruins. Most struggled to rebuild their devastated farms as thousands died from hunger. U.S. farmers stepped in to meet the demand for food. An ardent expansionist in both private and public life, President Monroe encouraged farmers to spread west and snap up land for food production to sell to Europe. He removed the property and income tax and allowed banks to hand out cheap loans to anyone willing to trek out west and snap up a farm. Moving west also meant conflict with indigenous tribes, which fed even deeper into Monroe's belief in the need for a strong national defense. As American farmers, bank loans in hand, grabbed more and more land, and produced more and more products for Europe, the American economy boomed. In time, however, the Europeans were able to get back on their feet and supply their own food. This caused a sudden drop in demand, which meant the farmers were no longer making enough profits to pay off their loans. The bubble had burst, and the U.S. entered its first ever peacetime recession, the Panic of 1819. But even more bad omens awaited the country as it entered the year 1820. In 1820, a new state applied for entrance into the Union, Missouri. Up to this point, southern states like Alabama had entered the Union quite naturally as slave states, while northern states like Illinois joined as free. In 1820, there was an equal division between slave and free states, which meant equal representation in the Senate. But Missouri's application for statehood presented a problem. Not only was it right in the middle between North and South, but its entrance into the Union as a slave state would break the tie between the North and the South in the Senate. It was also a gateway state to the West, which revealed an essential problem for America's imperial ambitions. As America continued to move westward, would new lands be reserved for free or slave labor? A lot would depend on Missouri. As the issue gained momentum, Passions flared, and talk of disunion began to sweep the nation. Between the Panic of 1819 and the sectional divisions over Missouri, Monroe's era of good feelings was proving to be little more than a thin veneer. Ultimately, a compromise was reached in the Senate which admitted Missouri as a slave state, while carving a piece of Massachusetts out to become the free state of Maine. Now the balance was 12 to 12. And additionally, it was agreed that a line would be drawn at the southern border of Missouri. Anything above that line would be free, anything below could be slave. The Compromise of 1820 prevented a possible civil war, but sectional tensions would flare up again in the 1830s, and then in the 1840s, and most conspicuously, in the 1860s. Monroe, like most presidents, would leave the house divided, in hopes that a nation could survive half slave and half free. All the while, he would continue to encourage his country to expand without addressing the question of slavery. In 1819, he encouraged Andrew Jackson to attack the Spanish in Florida, eventually bringing them to terms and scooping up that territory. In the Adams Onus Treaty, Spain not only ceded Florida, but additional lands out west stretching all the way to the Pacific Ocean. The U.S. jointly occupied this land with the British until President Polk settled the question in the late 1840s, creating the border between the U.S. and Canada as we know it today. 
By the end of 1819, no single figure in American history could boast of having increased the size of the Republic more than James Monroe. That same year, Monroe ran unopposed for re-election, the only person in American history to do so. Despite being elected in an obvious landslide, Monroe gradually faded to the background, as the young up-and-comers of his cabinet spent the next years jockeying to replace him at the end of his second term. Despite his lame duck status, however, Monroe completed his most far-reaching achievement in 1823, taking to the rostrum to deliver a speech in the House of Representatives, the last of the founder presidents, adorned in his outdated colonial outfit, outlined a foreign policy vision for the United States, which would forever define America's place in the world. We should consider any attempt on the part of European nations to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety. The American continents are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European power. Although the U.S. lacked power to enforce it, the Monroe Doctrine would gain greater significance as the United States grew into an imperial power, and eventually a global hegemon. James Monroe enjoyed a career of American statesmanship unparalleled in our country's history. As president, he strove to unite his country under a sanitized mythology, which painted the revolution as something completed, something to look back on with pride, not something to engage in in the present. But the revolution Monroe celebrated in his pageants and parades was far from complete. Sectional divisions continued to fester. Partisanship lurked just under the surface. And perhaps most crucially of all, the yoke of African-American enslavement and inequality sunk its talons deeper and deeper into the fabric of this nation. Monroe taught his country how to comfort itself with patriotic fantasies, while under his rule, the shining example of Republican government morphed into the very imperial structure it purported to fight against. In the decades that followed, the unchecked excesses of American expansion would lead to costly wars, genocidal persecutions of Native Americans, the perpetuation of slavery, and eventually, the costliest war in America's history. In the chaos and devastation of that civil conflict, another president would hearken back to the mythology of the revolution. But this time, the four score and seven years, which had elapsed since the nation's founding, would serve not as a cause for vapid platitudes of empty patriotism, but as a recommitment to the values set down in the revolution and a reimagining of the founder's assertion that all men are created equal.